Good morning, everyone. Uh, those of you are, who are online who are just joining us, um, greetings in the name of Yahushua Hamashiach, uh, the one we refer to as Jesus Christ, and welcome to today's Bible study. Um, it is the Kingdom of God series. We are going to hopefully conclude on the truth, which is one of those uh, series that we started a few months ago. Uh, my name is Richard Carty. Uh, for those who does not, do not know me, and I worship here at a chapel uh, here in Cayman. The focus text throughout this presentation has always been uh, Third John uh, 1 and 2. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul uh, prospereth. Uh, that is God's intent. That is his will. That is his purpose. Um, that believers, anyone that know him, that come in contact with uh, the Father, um, will prosper. Prosper in every area of their lives and be in good health. That was God's intent. It's not that way today uh, because, um, in my view, there's a lot of wrong teaching. Uh, you know, you can only set one exam and pass that exam successfully if you write on the exam the things that the um, the faculty or the, 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 you know, the teaching faculty expect you to write. Um, you know, we do the same thing uh, throughout the educational facility. We are tested based on uh, the things that are being taught uh, by the institution. And their expectation is that we regurgitate and we note on paper what they expect us um, uh, to write there. Not, not what we expect or not what we think it should be, their expectations and oftentimes Christians don't find the Christian faith attractive they don't find that the Christian faith works because their expectations are not being met but the scripture doesn't talk about our expectations it talks about his expectations Yeshua says seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you that's primarily our responsibility and Yeshua then says to us uh, because he says it's impossible to please God, but one must believe coming to God that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This reward, as John wrote uh, here in uh, 3 John 1, 2, is that we might prosper. And if we're not prospering, if we're not in good health, then there is something wrong with our theology, uh, which this series um, uh, tends to echo. So the presentation will last for about 45 minutes, so we'll have 15 minutes uh, question time. Um, all mics muted. I um, sound like I'm getting a slight echo for some reason. There's a slight echo coming. Um, all questions in the chat, um, or, the, or the mic is turned up uh, too loud, um, Alton. Uh, all questions can be put in the chat and then we will answer or try to answer uh, the questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, the material and the recording will be available. Uh, if you need the particular material that you see here on screen and you want it now because for reasons that you probably want to reflect over the week, you can always send me an email, Richard Carty, that's my name, at yahoo.co.uk. That's Richard Carty, that's my name, at yahoo.co.uk. Uh, co.uk. Um, also, the biblical positions uh, presented here are the, the, the views of the presenter, not necessarily uh, the views of the establishment he represent. Last week, we talked about science, um, and I tried to demystify some of the concerns as it relates to science, because, you know, you always get this term uh, science prove that there is a God, or the science prove that there, the Bible is true and stuff like that. Well, you really have to go at that in a certain way. And as I noted last week, uh, there are two types of science. Uh, there is what we call the science of nature, and then you've got this term modern science. Um, the science of nature pursues the application of knowledge and the understanding of nature or the natural world and the social world in which we exist. It does not seek to provide complete answers for all questions uh, because science can't do that. Uh, if science provide um, uh, um, 
answers to all questions. The notion of believing uh, in God by faith will be nullified because science proves or determines things which are natural and not necessarily things which are spiritual. Well, we haven't got there yet. Got there yet. Um, <coughs> the, the science of the natural world also depicts that the world is understandable. We know this um, through the breakthroughs and various different um, uh, uh, science explorations. We enjoy things like going at the speed of sound. We fly at the speed of sound. We can fly at the speed of sound uh, because we understand the laws that govern uh, this physical universe that we are living in. And also the, the science um, that uh, tries to understand nature, or the science of nature, um, knows that it's not, it is not the authoritarian, uh, it does not have an authoritarian position. In other words, science does not take primary position. And that's important. Um, it's important because we live in two worlds. We live in a natural world and we live in a spiritual world simultaneously. We exist on both planes of existence at the same time. Why? Because we are spirit, but we are also a physical body. Well, we know that we're here, but we also know that as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, we are also there. Um, and, and that is something, you know, as Christians that we come to understand that we shouldn't look at the natural, but rather look at the things which are unseen. Uh, and, and there are various teachings around that. Also, Genesis, in the beginning, God created as being an, always an exploration of natural science. Um, and there's a lot that we've spoken about last week concerning the science that's already been put in the Bible. Um, and it is there for us to understand um, and to know. These things were written, why? For your learning. They're written so you might know and understand. Uh, modern science, however, um, often is ratified on the reputation of individuals. Uh, you've got various individuals to whom we pay a lot of attention to, at least in the ed education establishment, people like Einstein, uh, people like Isaac Newton, um, uh, people like Charles Darwin, he was the promoter of the evolutionary, thought, evolutionary uh, gospel, if you like, evol evolutionism, if you like. Um, you got Galileo. Um, uh, he discovered, or uh, at least pretend to in imply that he discovered the, the, the cosmos. Well, that's not true. You know, back in um, Egyptology, um, the Babylon Empire, these, in, these groups of people knew about the, the cosmos long before modern science uh, uh, came, uh, came into being, and you got Pythagoras, uh, you know, the, the mathematician, uh, etc. So you've got various individuals to whom that we pattern allegiance to because Galileo said it, or because Sir Isaac, Isaac Newton said it, or because Al, um, uh, Albert Einstein said it. Somehow we think it's authenticated uh, because individuals say it. Well, that's not science at all. Um, that's just uh, following a particular trend or following a particular theological posi um, um, theoret theoretical position. Uh, and, and again, modern science is very modern. It's only in the last 200, 300 years uh, these individuals, particularly of European descent, came forward uh, saying that they discovered or saying that they were the pioneers of certain things in science. And those, that, this particular science, and we have to be absolutely clear about this, is very anti-God. Um, it is very anti-God. It perpetrates an anti-God position. And it's quite ironic that we send our children to school and we sit back, tell God he is great, but our children are taught principles and concepts which are anti-God. In other words, they're against the concept of God. So our kids go off to university and they come back and they question the things that we believe because science has discovered or science has said. And we sit there having no answers to the questions that they're posing. Why? Because we lack knowledge of the scriptures. Jesus said to, his, said to the people of his time, he says, you err, uh, E-R, uh, 
it means that you don't come to the, the, the full understanding of the scriptures. As a result, you fall away. That was what er means. He says, because you lack the knowledge of the scriptures. We're supposed to, according to scripture, give an answer to every man who asks us, us of the salvation that we have. We're supposed to be able to give an answer to every man. So if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, my daughter died. Why did he die? I mean, uh, terrible situation in, in, in the U.S. just recently uh, where uh, uh, this guy, this gunman, took a gun and shoot, uh, you know, 14 or 19 kids. 19? I think it was 19 or 20 kids. Shot them dead. Exactly. The question is, Why? And someone comes to church the following day and they ask the question, why? We're supposed to be able to give an answer. Christ says, I put prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, all of these individuals in the church so to help the church pr progress. So there should be a prophetic word. There should be a word of knowledge. That's why we're here. I wish above all else that we might prosper in being good health. So the, the modern science tends to take a different view uh, to um, uh, uh, biblical theology. And, and, and therefore, the body of Christ needs to be cognizant of the, um, the, um, their, their ideas, their, their theories, their... Uh, um, Theoretical, theoretical, if you like, uh, positions we supposed to know. It's not good enough we know about the stories of John. We get this regurgitated every day. We stand up here and someone tells you about the story of John. I've been in church for more than 40 years. I do not want to know the story of John. I know the story of John. I want to know what God has to say about the matters that we are facing in our society today. That's what I want to know. So when we come to this place of, we call worship, uh, it's a building. When we come to this place where we assemble, uh, we are to hear what the Spirit is saying to us for this particular, uh, for this appointed time. So we can advise others, so we can tell others what is to come. I think that's very important, and I think we need to really engage in understanding what's going on in our society today. We've got witchcraft on television or, or throughout. We've got pornography on television, which we sit down and we're entertained by. We've got, which we've got, uh, I was watching, um, I think it was, um, oh my gosh, this, this program called um, America's Idol. You know, I was sort of flicking through the channel. I don't particularly pay attention to those things. I was watching and these guys come up on stage and they do things and they claim that they could be explained. They actually say to the audience, when I was a child, this person, this person I couldn't see, and they give it a name, like Desmond. And then they call it by what it is. They refer to it as a spiritual entity. And he is giving them instructions of what to do. And we get up on stage and they do their little thing and everybody clap and everybody's, you know, sort of memorized by what's going on. It's witchcraft. And we are entertained by it. In church, we're entertained by witchcraft. Why? Because we lack the knowledge of the scriptures. Witchcraft, the term witchcraft is anyone who exercises dominion over you. That's, that's, the, that's the definition of witchcraft. Anyone who goes out of the way to exercise dominion or power over you, to control you. This is the way you get to God. If you do this, 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 this is how you get to God. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads you to the Father. Nobody else. I don't. Nobody does. Only the Holy Spirit. He's be, he'd be a witness with your spirit, not me. But yet we have people who stand in pulpits and stand in, uh, on, 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 in, in audiences and they try to influence people. They try to sort of coerce, manipulate people in order for them to believe in the things that they adhere to. We've got all types of things. We've got the Big Bang Theory, evolution, humanism or transhumanism, all constantly changing. Their position on these particular sciences are changing. And I don't say this, I don't say this gently. The church is placid to the most part about what is really going on in the world today. It's almost as if we are asleep. And we need to do something about it. 
the idea, you know, we say science, we often are told uh, science proves that there is a God, a God in, or the existence of God. That's, a not, that's absolute nonsense. Science does not prove. It corroborates. It supports. When we look in Romans and he says, though they knew God, but didn't glorify him as God, but worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The idea is science is used to corroborate because God says the heavens and the earth is my handiwork. But a man must come to God first. How he comes first? He says, Hebrews eleven sixteen. Now, f without faith, it's impossible to please God. The scriptures, and I said this last week, don't want to go over the topic, but the scriptures and the things of God, biblical truths, are a matter of faith and only are ex accessible through faith. Woman, the time has come and now is, the woman at the well, that they that worship God, no more turning to Jerusalem, putting down your cloth on your ground, holding up a few crosses and all the kind of gizmos that we do today. The time is now is that they that worship me must worship me. How? Spirit. There is no flesh. There is no church to worship God. This is what we have perpetrated as traditions and culture. To that end, we've made God's word of no effect. Because most people classify coming to church as a time of worship when our lives throughout our lives every day of the week we are in a state of worship why why is that because the holy spirit says i am always with you god says i'm always with you our entire life is a time of is a is a state of worship but we coin, coin the idea that church is worship or oh, at least coming into this building because church means people it's exclusive as the actual people. Some even go as far as saying science proves that the Bible is true. Absolute nonsense. I mean, you got dead, dead screech skulls that was found uh, a few years ago, and they tried to you know, prove it through apologetics and all this kind of stuff. I think that has its place. But first and foremost, a man must believe who God is first. And must come to him by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because faith is a matter. It's a God's idea. And it's a spiritual idea. These things corroborate. And the right type of science, the science of nature, like I mentioned, is the things that corroborate, um, uh, corroborate the existence of God. So the, the access to God and the kingdom of God, biblical truth, is a matter of faith, not science, not law, not religion, not culture, not belief. Over this particular duration of study, we looked at how truth can be seen or how God intended to transmit truth. God is omniscient, he's all-powerful, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, all everywhere, and can do absolutely everything at the same time. He is not subject to time. He created time in Genesis, but not subject to it. So when it says Christ was crucified from the foundation of the world, we try to figure out what was God talking about? He was crucified 2,000 years ago. No, not really. He was created, crucified from the foundation of the world. That's what the scripture said. Because he's outside of time. What's time in your and I and my imagination? We say today and tomorrow. There's a distance between today and tomorrow. That's classified as time. Time has passed, we say. It's not such a thing. God uses the very language in order to communicate truth. And we went through that in the early part of the series. He uses the cosmos. The scripture says the creation is his handiwork. He's created times and seasons, so these are for the Lord's, the scripture teaches. Um, not necessarily seasons as winter, summer, spring, autumn. But actually, he wrote in the stars his intent and his purpose, so that it might be seen of men. And he cooperated that in Romans, where he said, though they knew God, they did not worship him. He also put it in man. The truth is written in man. The very composition of our physical form. <clears throat> I was looking at a program and they were talking about abortion. And uh, in the UK, you can abort after six, six months, I think it is. 
as a physical being. And it is, it is, it is devilish. Sorry? Before six months. Up to six months, you can abort. And that's a law. They've made that law. Isn't that devilish? What's the church doing about it? Are we telling our children this wickedness? Are we calling it something else? Because we find comfort at times calling things something else. God says, um, a man lying with another man is an abomination. We call it gay. Or we call it, you know, trans or something else. We kind of change the meaning of the word somehow to ease our conscience. God call it an abomination. We don't even want to call it an abomination. Because we might offend a few folk. And if the guy that we are voting for is um, a pro, you know, uh, gay activist, we certainly don't want to offend him because we're friends. So we call it what they call it, God call it an abomination. A woman lying with a beast, God call it an abomination. We say things like every man to his own. But we get up in these places and we tell people, God is great, God is great, and we don't say what he says. Though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Science, uh, uh, the truth is also written in science. You can, and I showed you a number of scriptures in the Bible that corroborates the idea that God created the firmament. The Bible says he hewed it out like a, a blacksmith will hew out their firmament. He separated the waters from above the firmament, so there was waters above the sky. This is what the scripture teaches. You've got the firmament, which is the disk that we can see, and then you've got waters above that from the waters which are beneath the firmament. And God says it was so and it was good. So we know that's uh, something above the sky that we can see. We talk about space and space going on, you know, alpha quadrant, delta quadrant, and it goes on for billions and billions of light years and so on. The scriptures doesn't teach that. But it's science. And lastly, we talk about, we are going to talk about history today. Uh, and I say the last covenant is the first covenant revealed. If you want to understand the last, the, first, the last covenant, which is the New Testament, you want to understand the first covenant, which is what we refer to as the Old Testament. You really want to understand that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Romans says, uh, 15, uh, five, 15 verse 5, verse 4, sorry, these things were written for our instructions. What things? The things were written in the first covenant that were written for our instructions. And we ought to know them. We ought to know why we have the Sabbath. We ought to know what the tabernacle meant. We ought to know what the sacrificial lamb meant. We ought to know these things. We ought to know what tithes and offering meant in the first covenant. So, the historical context of the Bible is written in the first covenant. Um, and I'm getting to, I'm getting to my, my, my point here. Um, about history. I'm not going to talk about the history of, um, of, of Christianity. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about the history of the world. Um, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Here, history is to talk about our history. Our history is written in the first covenant. The forefathers or the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. That's where our history is written. And we don't even know it. We don't know our history. If you don't know your history, you really couldn't, you don't know your, 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 your future. And, and they say that if you don't know the things that you fail on in the past, you have a tendency, or there is a tendency for you to fail on those things in the future. We don't know our history. Most people have concluded that the Old Testament is a bunch of laws. Christ came to fulfill a law. We don't need to read the Old Testament anymore. That's a lie. It's nonsense. You ought to know your history in order for you to know for you, your future. And like I said, the um, last covenant is, is concealed in the first covenant, and the first covenant reveals, the, la the, the, the last covenant reveals the first covenant. It was concealed in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. That's what I'm saying. And we talk about the Sabbath. What was the Sabbath? Well, it says in Genesis, it says God rested 
on the Sabbath day, he rested from all his works. He says, and on the seventh day, God ended his works, which he has made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he has made. He didn't rest because he was tired. He rests because he finished his work. Oh, we're going to, I'm, talk about, I'm going to talk about that rest in another session um, and how important that rest means. But he rests because he's finished his work. Very similar to when a lawyer says, he talks, you know, he says to the jury, he says to uh, the judge, uh, you know, he delivers his case and so on, and then he sits down and he says, I rest my case. He don't rest his case and walk out because he's tired. In other words, there is nothing more to say. So God had nothing more to do because everything he did, he said, it is good. And he rested on the seventh day. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. And he rested from all his works that he has created. Now we've turned this into a showboat because we've got a, a lot of people who do, does nothing. They don't, they don't do nothing. They don't cook. They don't do. That's like taking lambs and sacrificing them today to say, I can receive um, forgiveness of sins. That was fulfilled. We know it was fulfilled in the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the last covenant because it was concealed in the first covenant. We know it was revealed in the last covenant. Yeshua said this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. He says, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heaven laden, I will give you rest. Was that rest from tiredness? It was rest from the fall. In other words, they would now enter into my rest. Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 11, 4, or Hebrews, uh, 4, 1, uh, Hebrews 11, 1 to 4, so on. And I'll talk about that another time. But this idea of rest, Christ says, take my yoke upon me, none of me. I am gently and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. <clears throat> so Christ, Christ fulfilled the Sabbath, and he says, this is the true rest. What was in the first covenant was a type and a shadow of the rest to come. And when he said on the cross, it is finished, he says, now enter into my rest. He says, come all you who are heavy laden. And that was under the judgment, hence the word. Therefore now there is no condemnation. Condemnation is a legal word. It has nothing to do with oh, I feel sorry for what I've done. It's a legal word. And Satan made that clear. In the Gospels, when Satan said to Christ, when he was tempted, he said this to Christ. He says, all of these kingdoms I will give you, for they were given to me freely. If you bow down and worship me. Man was under condemnation. He was under the, the control, the hospice of Satan. And God came, and he set us free. And he says, now enter into my rest. This is very important. <laughs> the tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a place where um, they congregated uh, to worship often. Um, it was a place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God put the Ark of the Covenant, you know, and they were, uh, at, at the end of the session, yeah, they were able to come into the, um, in, into the tabernacle to do sacrifices for covering of sins and so on. It was what we call the holy of holy places. Where in the new covenant is the tabernacle represented? When Christ came, he made a switch. Because remember they were talking about the tabernacle and they were boasting about Solomon's building and Yeshua told them, he says, not one brick will be left upon another. And they were talking about the glory of what um, Solomon built. And Jesus says, the tabernacle has come. It's now within you. And he says, and he makes emphasis that your body is now has become the temple, in other words, temple of the Holy Ghost. And we are to sanctify it wholly and present it with our Father without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what the scripture teaches. So where's the tabernacle? Is it this building? No, it's not. This is a building. Your temple is, your tabernacle or your temple is the holy place where the holy of holies lives. So you cannot do what you choose with your body. Why? Because you've been bought with a price, the scripture says, and you are no longer your own. So this body that we garnish with all sorts of things is not yours to command. 
That's what the scripture teaches. Where do I know this? Look back in the history of the Bible, in the history of what is written in the first covenant, and it tells us what, how important the tabernacle was. And if you were to walk inside there without going through the, nat, the, not, the normal uh, preparations, you would fall down dead. Nowadays, folk, Christian folk, couldn't care less about what God says concerning their tabernacle. They eat things and they um, participate in activities. They defile their bodies. Today, uh, sexuality, uh, immorality around, uh, in terms of uh, uh, sexuality is perverted. One partner to the next partner, that didn't work out, next partner, that didn't work out, next partner, that didn't work out. And the kids are starting early from the age of 12. And we laugh at it. We think it's funny. Polluting the very thing that God says that we, that belongs to him, particularly if you're a born again believer. The Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. Again, that was, we see that in the Old Testament. This is the history I'm talking about. And in, <coughs> um, uh, in, in Exodus, and where the congregation of Israel came together and they said, uh, on the tenth month of every, every man shall take to himself a lamb according to his house and his father, a lamb according to his household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, he will go to his neighbor and take according to the number of persons, according to each man's need. You will have to make your account for the lamb. Your lamb will be without blemish. I wonder what God meant when he says that our bodies are without blemish in terms of the tabernacle. The lamb will be without blemish, uh, and it will be a male of the first year. You will take it from your sheep or from the goats. Uh, now you will keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. I wonder what was the killing of the lamb supposed to represent in the last covenant? Christ, of course. Behold the lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. That's our history, by the way. And if we don't understand this, we make a mess of what's written in the first covenant. Actually, if we don't understand what's written in the last covenant, we take what's written in the first covenant for granted absolutely for granted and we do really make a mess of things they did not understand the righteousness of God went about went about seeking their own righteousness the scripture teaches so I'm not going to labor on the history I think most people understand when I talk about history and I refer to the Old Testament what it is. And by the way, throughout the Old Testament is every way that we're supposed to live revealed in the New Testament. Every way. Actually, we're supposed to know the things which are written aforehand for they were written according to what the New Testament writers say. They were written for our learning. So we might be furnished properly. So the question in this series is what is truth? That's a big question, and I, I hope you followed um, uh, what's following this series because by now you should be able to tell me what is truth. I'm sort of leading the witness here because I say um, how, the how is acknowledging and receiving God's love for you. What I'm saying is the only way you can define truth is if you know how much God loves you. And people say that casually. They say, oh, God loves me. Well, there's a number of things to note if you knew that. If, God, if you knew that God loves you, you'll never worry. If you knew that God loves you, the Bible says, take no thought for yourselves, what you should eat and what you should drink. If you knew how much Christ meant that, you will never worry. Because Christ says, take no thought. He didn't even say, oh, by the way, you know, you, you should prepare, you should sort things out. He says, take no thought. My point to here, to this thing about the how, concerning the truth, in order to know the truth, you have to know God's love for you. That settles it. 
And the why is that the human existence is for us to enjoy. This was God's intent for us to enjoy. When God made Adam, when God made Eden, God furnished Eden with all the things that he knew that Adam was uh, going to enjoy. And he said to Adam, everything you can eat, everything you can eat in this garden. And by the way, the word garden is, means that it was organized. The, the definition of garden means organized. Um, if you look at a bush, a bush is unorganized, a garden is organized. So the definition between Eden and the rest of the world was Eden was organized. And we see that when you do landscaping and all of these guys uh, who are uh, participating in that role in, in society. When you build a house, you don't just build it in a bush. You organize um, the, land, the land that is around it. So the human experience is for us to enjoy. I wish above all else, um, Sir Third John 1-2, that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul uh, prospereth. In other words, God expects us to prosper not in only uh, uh, our education. He expects us to prosper in our finances. He expects us to prosper as a father. He expects us to prosper as a husband or wife. He's expect, expecting us to prosper in all things. And then he expects us to be in good health. And this is not God is thinking about your health. He expects because he was Again, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And guess what that meant? By his stripes, we were healed. Somebody was, will tell you something like, uh, you know, we're going to pray for God to heal you right now. I'm going to pray. This is, this is absolute nonsense. And there are those who might get offended that think that God heals them right now. God healed you from the foundation of the world. You have to appropriate what he's already done. In other words, you have to go and receive what he's already done. If I go to a party, I have an expectation that food is prepared and all the other garnishes and so on. So how do I actually enjoy the party? Do I go and cook my food and bring it to the party? No. I turn up at the party and I expect that the party is organized and there's food and so on and so forth and etc. And then I am there to enjoy. Christian folks are doing this work. And it is our experience that we might enjoy what Christ has provided for us. But we are not enjoying it because we are making out and we are turning what he did into our own personal belief. They, ignorant of God's righteousness, went about and established their own righteousness. That's not doing, by the way. That's a position. So we don't enjoy the human experience. We don't enjoy Christianity or we don't enjoy our faith in God because we are doing the work. And we're not resting in his internal purpose and so on. We don't know his love for us. If you know God's love, you will know the truth. You will know what grace is about. You will know what government is about. Here's the dichotomy here because people use the term God saved me and they reflect on their doing based on what God did. You cannot reflect on what you did and sort of said, that's the reason why God saved me. Because I was a wretch. I wasn't good enough. God did what he did because of what Adam did, not what you did. You're not a sinner because you sinned. You're a sinner because you got what Adam had, and he had a fallen nature. That word condemnation, he came to take away the fallen nature. So now, therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. In other words, there's no legal power that Satan could issue against you because you're no longer in Christ. You're no longer in, in his domain. You're in Christ. So grace is God's unmerited favor on what? Yet we were in our sins or yet we had this foreign nature. God died for us. And he died on us for us based on his love for us. Then we ought to know, we ought to know how much Christ loves us. And that God wants us to get us back under his government. Not on the democracy, um, you know, uh, uh, capitalism, socialism, and all the different types of uh, governance we have on earth. God wanted us to, to get under his government because his government is his intent, his will, and his purpose. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring us onto his government. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That term kingdom of God is his government. As a matter of fact, the scripture teaches, and we know it, 
he will come back and the government, what government he's talking about shall be upon his shoulder. Well, his will, his intent, and his purpose. So we pray, thy will be done. That's what we pray. Father, thy will be done on earth as it is where you are. So if we know God's love, my point here is it will enforce, it will bring us to the knowledge of his grace, his truth, and his government. Yeshua says in John 14, 6, he says, For I am the way, the truth, life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He says that I am the way. He says I am the truth. How do you and I know that? We need to know his love for us. Corinthians, sorry, Ephesians put it this way. Ephesians says that we might know the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of his love. That we might be filled with the fullness of God. Yeshua again talks about this idea of peace. You know, that was the first thing that he said when he came to this world. You know, that's the first thing that he said. That's the first thing that God said. He sent two angels, or sent some angels, and Yeshua was being born. And the first thing they say, peace on earth, goodwill. Because God expects us to enjoy the experience. And we cannot enjoy the experience if we're not in peace. The first thing that the disciple, the first thing that Christ said to the disciples on every turn, he says, peace be unto you. When he was, when he, when he was, uh, when he rose from the dead and they were frightened, they were in the upper room and they were wondering what next to do, the Bible says, and he appeared in their presence and he says, peace be unto you. The idea of grace is the acknowledgement of God's peace. But that's predicated on the knowledge of, you know, of his love. Because if you don't know his love, you don't understand his grace and you cannot receive his peace. And I'm, I, I just did a diagram just to represent some of the things we're going to finish in a minute. Uh, here is it. The symptoms that we have. Sickness, fear, doubt, unforgiveness, insecurity, anger, inferiority, complexes, anxiousness. All are predicated on how much we know God's love us. If we don't know God's love for us, we're going to always be saying, I did not do enough. I wonder if I'm doing enough. That's a big thing, right? That's a huge thing. Because if you lose a loved one next to you and so on, the question that's on everybody's mind, why did this happen to me? If you lose your house, if your body is sick and you're going through all sorts, the question is, why me, God? We don't know his love for us. And therefore, the sickness continues. The fear continues. Irrespective of us talking to God and telling him all of these things. Then reading the scriptures. It took me a long time to understand this. But now I know it because the Holy Spirit reveals to me. And I'm going to show you this. It says, the lack of knowledge of God's love for us towards you is the root cause of sickness, fear, doubt, unbelief unforgiveness, insecurity, anger, inferiority, complexes, and anxiousness. We don't know his love for us. And remember the, script, the scripture says here, the, the text I says here, how is the how? Acknowledging and receiving God's love for us. You need to walk around on a daily basis because you need to re-educate your mind. You need to, I know, Father, that you love me. I know that your love towards me is the best. We are offended when people don't tell us I love you, or when people don't appreciate what we do. Why are we offended? Because we don't know Christ's love for us. Christ's love is sufficient. I don't need your love towards me. It's nice, but I don't need it because he loves me. This is the God of the universe loves me. That's the difference. That's the differentiator. So if you have God, if you know God's love for you, if you're acknowledging God's love towards you, you are going to be in better health. You are going to be this idea of well-being, 
prosperity, faith and hope and love, forgiveness and trust. That's on the knowledge of how much. Now, the way you are today is directly related to your understanding and knowledge of God's love for you. Why am I saying this? Because I'm trying to say that a truth can only be understood, can really be understood if you know God's love for you. And it's not easy. I can give you a thousand examples, typical example, that my husband says to his wife, do you love me? They've been together for 30 years, and she's still asking, do you love me? Or the husband says to his wife, or the wife says to his son, do you love me? She wants assurance or to assure herself if this person loves me. Because sometimes their behavior is just off the charts. So they ask the question, do you love me? He doesn't take her out for Valentine. She asks the question, do you love me? He doesn't give you a birthday card. He asks, she asks the question, do you love me? Don't talk to me or cuddle me the way you used to. He says, do you love me? And then there's this comparative thing, you know, what they're doing out there. Oh, you know, how come you don't say that to me? And all the stuff that's in social media, a lot of it is corruption. But my point here is that we are always looking to get some form of affirmation from people based on their love for us. And we take it for granted because we say God is love and God is all of these things. We take it for granted that we know God's love for us, but the scripture doesn't teach that. Because if you go into Ephesians chapter 1, it tells you that God strengthens our inner man with might. In other words, God wants us to know his love. He wants us to know the depth of it, the length of it, the breadth of it, the height of it, that we might be filled with the fullness of God. That's God's intent. And you could come every Sunday and say all sorts of things to God and not know his love for you. Lord, we perish. The disciples cried out in the boat. Lord, save us. What? And we cry out to God often because we don't know God's love for us. You can take this away. You can measure how much you know God's love. And I guarantee you, in the areas where you're successful, you kind of have a better understanding of what God is speaking about in those areas, and therefore, um, it works for you, and it is profitable. But there is a lot of people who don't know God's love for them, and therefore, they're experiencing sickness. Christians experience sickness all the time. I mean, the fear of COVID has rippled and rampant through the entire churches. It's, it's unbelievable. Nobody stands up and declares, by his stripes I'm healed. If they do it, they do it in secret corners, but they talk about COVID. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. The last slide I'm going to leave, Ephesians 2, 4 to 8, he says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, uh, which, sorry, with which he loved us. Even when he, we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. What comes first? Is it grace or is it his love? His love. As a matter of fact, Yeshua says, the world will know that you are my disciples when you love one another as what? I have loved you. What comes first? You loving one another or I loving you? I loving you. You can only give away what you've got. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace we are saved through faith and it's not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. So we talk about grace in this text. We talk about, um, uh, uh, we talk about um, riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. But they're predicated on knowing his great love towards us. That's what the scripture talk, talks about in the initial stages of his introduction. His great love towards us. I could almost prove if you were to walk away from here from this text today and you were to actually try to understand how much God loves you and pay attention to it, your life will change.
because we are believers who don't know how much Christ loves us. My time is, my time is gone. Oh, do we have any questions? Um, I don't see anything in the chat. Any questions in the audience? Any, any thoughts? Got a mic for, for those who are here in the audience. For those who are online, if you would like to just shout out or um, drop a note in the text, I could, I could try to answer your questions. But this is important. This is very, very important. We know the truth when we know his love for us. We know his grace when we know his love for us. We understand the kingdom of God when we know his love for us. God will treat you differently to how he treats me because my commission or the things that he called me to do is different from what he called you to do. He's a God of individuality in terms of he deals with us on an individual basis. He might talk to us corporately at times, but he certainly deals with us on an individual basis. And he wants us to know how much he loved us. And that's where it starts. The tragedy with most Christians is they tell them, we say get saved and everything is going to be all right. Or we get saved and we get them to do some work. Now go and, you know, do a work for God, we say. The tragedy with that is people never get to know who God is. And as a result, they get burnt out or they get disencouraged or they do what the world do and say what the world says. I was, I was sick um, the other day, about three months ago and so on. I came down with shivers and all sorts and uh, Jackie told me, take a lateral flow test. We took it, and she said, uh, it, it, uh, she couldn't get the reading. She says, I, I think you have COVID. Um, I, I felt shivers. I mean, it, was, it wasn't normal. It wasn't a normal uh, uh, call. But I didn't think about COVID, or I didn't think, um, you, know, you know, I had COVID or whatever. Anyway, I took the afternoon off from work, and I prayed. I first I had Lord's Supper, because... That's how we receive God's healing in one respect. Uh, God says, yeah, eat this bread. As often as you eat it and you drink this cup, you do show my death. That idea of death was he actually came and took away our sicknesses and our diseases. It's by his stripes we were healed. That's what the scripture teaches. I took Lord's Supper. I do this all the time anyway. Anytime I feel a little tickling, I take Lord's Supper and I say, Father, I remembered what you did for me. And then secondly, I begin to pray, but very specifically begin to pray. The following day, I, the following one I took, um, the day off. The following morning, I took off, and by the afternoon, I was back at work. I don't want to tolerate sickness in my body whatsoever. And this is a this is a position that I've always stood on. The Bible says, "Building up yourself in your most holy faith." You have to exercise your faith. In other words, your faith comes from God because it's a gift of God, but you have to exercise it. You don't wait for sickness to come to exercise your faith. You are exercising your faith at all times. A friend of mine has lupus, and she had lupus for a long time. She's a dear friend. She's a dear Christian and so on. And she, uh, you know, have difficulty and so on. And I spoke to her, and I, I shared with what the Lord has shown me uh, concerning his love uh, for me. And she is now building up herself on her most holy faith. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying here is that unless you know God's love for you, all of these things will, they will stick around, and they will stick around longer uh, uh, than, uh, they will stick around longer than they should. You should not tolerate sickness because you're the heel whom the devil is trying to make you think you are sick. In other words, healed, and sickness comes, hits my body, I feel it, whether it's my mind, I feel it, whatever, and you should not tolerate it. I can't teach this in two minutes. This is a matter of changing your paradigm. Fear and doubt and unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a big ticket here because most people think that they forgive. Well, if you don't know God's love for you, you really don't forgive. Because if the person did what they did to you seven times in a day, you'll probably curse them out. And say, I'll never forgive you. We think we forgive. But unless we know God's love for us, we really don't have the power to forgive. 
because forgiveness is a God thing. It's not a human idea. Yet we will, in our set trespasses, Christ said, I died. I forgave you long before you came into the knowledge of why. So forgiveness is a God thing. I mean, you can, you can humanize it. You can say, oh, you know, the world says, okay, I forgive you and so on. But they demand justice. And oftentimes justice is not just getting the courts to say he's guilty. Justice means I, if it's the death penalty, give him the death penalty. In other words, they want blood. Nothing wrong with having justice. But sometimes in justice, God might say to you, let it go. They won't listen to that because their 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 people are obviously telling them uh, you can get you can get X amount of dollars from this. You could make sure that this doesn't happen to somebody else, and so on and so on. So forget about what God has to say about America. So uh, the, these topics stick around longer than they should because we don't know God, uh, God's love for us. We don't know, and most Christians don't know. I know this by how people pray. I know this how, by how people live their lives. I know this, that they don't know God's love for them. And I had to deal with this um, about two years ago when God actually showed me this. He said, Richard, you don't know my love for you. And besides, when I get understanding of what God's word says, when I see what people do, it really messes with me because I know what they're saying and what they're doing is wrong. And they're going to regurgitate that and give it to their children. And then their children are going to have to fight to know the truth. And if, they, if I don't know it, they don't know it. I said, uh, um, and I got two minutes, I said a few, um, a few weeks back, I said a tragedy of introducing music into church is that people get oozed with the rhythm. Most people. A session like this is not welcome. It's not packed because guess what? It's not oozing with your emotions. I am telling you something. Now you have to use your mind to hear what I'm saying and to begin to press. The only labor Christ tells us to do is the labor that we enter not into his rest. You know, that's the only labor in the entire new covenant. Labor, we, we are to fear that we enter not into his rest. And we are to labor to enter into his rest. And it's all to do with the mind. Nothing else. We have to labor for nothing else because it's not by works we are saved. Only that we labor to enter into his rest. And I wonder how many people today are coming to church because they want healing. I wonder how many people are coming to church because they need to deal with some form of anxiety, some form of issue. Their kids are not doing what they're supposed to do and so on. So they come to church thinking that the church and what they say in church is going to solve the problem. It doesn't. It will help you to change your mind, and you should. But the changing of the mind is an individual thing. And you ought to change your mind. Praying for someone is like taking jumper cables and putting on a battery and starting the car. You take the jumper cables off. You know what you have to do with that car if the battery is flat? You just start the car. Before you use the car, what you do? You keep the battery, the engine idle for a while because your intent is to charge the battery. Because if you turn the car off immediately and you try to start the car, it wouldn't start because it used the energy from the other battery, which was a good one, to start the car. Most people, when they come to church, it's like somebody put jumper cables on, they hear a word from God, they hear the word of God and so on, and they're excited, and then they go and they switch they walk out the door and they switch and they wonder why Monday to Friday is a difficult time. They have not taken the word and meditated on it. They have not taken the word and regurgitated it and, and, and the Bible says study to show thyself approved. And they wonder why sickness and, and, and fear and unbelief and insecurity and the fact that they don't prosper and they're not in good health and this is not an enjoyable experience. And God intends, intends to have an enjoyable experience. He intends us to have an enjoyable experience. We need to charge our batteries. Anyway, um, that's the end of this session. I trust that it was helpful. Um, I can provide these slides to you. There's some uh, just under 300 slides. Um, I'll chop it up, make it in bits so you can do it. it. It talks in terms of all the things we talked about as far as the truth is concerned. Again, you've got... Um, 
um, recordings that you can look at to go back and so on. Our next session is going to be on the kingdom of God. If you thought that was challenging, wait till we get on this subject, the idea of the kingdom of God. And I, and I hope that this is making a difference uh, to those who are hearing it. Um, I don't believe I'm here by coincidence. Actually, my heart is not really wanting to be here. I'd rather be in the UK, to be honest, with my uh, kids and stuff like that. But I believe that this is an assignment. I believe that the Holy Spirit has given me an assignment to do. And it's just strange that it is here. That's uh, strange to me. Um, so next week, we're going to start on the kingdom of God. Be prepared for that. Again, we start at 9 and finish at 10 on the dot. So this is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions during the week, if you have any thoughts, I say things that hit people like a ton of bricks. You know, it's not always easy to listen to me. Uh, because I get to the point. Um, anyway, God bless you. Let's pray for a moment. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you are doing and continuing to do in this society, in the society that, that we live in, and the world that we live in. There's a lot of horrible things that are happening, things that might get us down. But, Father, we appropriate your love, and we come into the acknowledgement of your love for us, the body of Christ. You said the gates of hell will not prevail against us. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. He said, I have overcome the world. We have overcome the world through you, Father. And we testify of these things. They are true. And we believe these things. Holy Spirit, we desire that you might prepare our hearts for what is to come. And that we might have our minds seated and grounded, rooted in the knowledge of you. Trusting you always for the salvation of our soul. In Yeshua's name. Amen. God bless. We, I'm, I'm happy to answer the question. We're going to probably stop the recording because it is, nine, it is 10 o'clock. But yes.